thank you everyone for joining us in this ICMCI series of online seminars and panels. And today we have a really special panel. It's uh, what will the new normal look like? So we've asked uh, three of our leading consulting members to put their, their magic hats on to give us some forecasts from their perception of, of what they think uh, might be a new normal or a new abnormal, as I've heard more recently, and, and to give some insights about how consultants will uh, prepare. Uh, this session is being recorded uh, and it will be published on our ICMCI YouTube channel. And in terms of managing the discussion, and I find the discussion is really one of the most important parts of this, uh, please use your chat box to either comment amongst yourselves while the presenters are addressing us or to uh, ask questions. And as your moderator, I'll, I'll moderate, I'll, I'll, I'll overview the uh, chat box. And if there's any, um, any, any questions, I know there will be questions, I will, uh, I will moderate that discussion and uh, ask the questions at the end when we come together. Um, please keep your microphones muted uh, so that, unless you're speaking, just so that we avoid uh, any feedback or accidental interruptions of our, uh, of our speakers. Uh, before we start, I just want to acknowledge it's International Consultants Day. So I know many of you on this call were also on the call earlier today uh, where we celebrated International Consultants Day and uh, launched our National Consultants Index. So, uh, so it, uh, it's, it's a great day for us to celebrate. It's been a, it's been a, a busy, uh, a difficult year for, for all of us in society, but also especially for management consultants supporting our clients. So, uh, so this is a day for us to, uh, to celebrate. So I'm, I'm just really excited about, uh, about uh, the work that we're going to be doing now and, uh, and to hearing from our panelists. So, uh, so the first, uh, first uh, one that we have, which I would like to introduce, is uh, Alfred Harrell. Uh, Alfred is um, a CMC. Uh, he's uh, the uh, Chief Executive Officer of Harrell Consulting. He's the chairperson of WKO, which is the Austrian Federal uh, Economic Council. And he's the ICMCI delegate to, uh, to, uh, from Austria to ICMCI. So Alfred, welcome and thank you. And we're just uh, looking forward to, uh, to your comments. Fine. Thank you, Dwight. Hello, everybody. I start very quick because I have strong 10 minutes for you. So the coronavirus crisis has been one of the greatest challenges for Austrian companies. And I think worldwide or European wide in decades now for us every minute counts austria's consultants do whatever they can do to help business move forward the COVID 19 crisis hit the world needless to say the outlook of the business at least in the short term has changed radically in just a few weeks as everybody of you know let's start with some facts and how is the situation in austria for the world in which we live at the moment. First, some numbers for you. COVID-19 public health situation in Austria, and I explain it why, so that you know in which world we live now and why and how consultants can help your clients. We have more than 400,027 tests. We have about 17,000 confirmed cases. We have about 15,300 recovered. And we have about, sorry to say, 640 deaths. Unemployment has increased sharply by nearly 200,000 people. We now have an unemployment rate of about 12.8%, of about mainly in tourism, construction industry, and trade. GDP declined for the first quarter 2020, minus 2.9% compared to 2019. How badly is the Austrian economy hurt? Latest forecast, real GDP minus 5.25% to minus 7.5% in 2020. We didn't have such figures since I think 40 years or 50 years. In 21, we have a forecast for plus 3.5%, so it looks not so bad. Unemployment rate about 8.75 till 9.1%. Budget deficit according Maastricht definition, 7.5 till 10%. 
21, maybe just 3.3%. Measures so far, economic measures taken by the Austrian government in coordination with the Federal Chamber of Commerce, March 18, the Austrian government announced an economic aid package of about to 38 billion euros, biggest package we ever had, for supporting SMEs and short time working for loan guarantees for companies and sectors that have been particularly hard hit and for tax deferrals. Approach by the Austrian government, whatever it takes. And this gift is strong and give really uh, some, some um, uh, a package with us. Hardship fund for one person companies and micro enterprises in order to help affected companies through the crisis quickly. The Republic of Austria set up a hardship fund with a volume of 2 billion euro. The payments from the hardship fund, which is managed by the Austrian Federal Economic Chamber, are non-repayable grant. In total, a maximum of 12,000 will be granted in six months. Target group, one person companies, micro enterprises, new self-employed persons, independent contractors and liberal professions. Financial support by means of guarantees and interim loans. Corona assistance fund, 15 billion euro. Four, government guarantees for loans, non-repayable grants. Bridge finance guarantees due to the coronavirus crisis. Uh, for one person companies and SMEs and guarantee about to 25 million euro for SMEs in tourism and leisure industry loan amount up to 1.5 million. Measures to reduce liquidity, liquidity shortages regarding tax and social security, which is also very unique for us that we never did this, but a prepayments of income or corporate income tax for 2020 can be reduced or assist amounting to zero. Social security, deferment of contribution, etc. Another big package is the Corona short time work. Seven, seven billion euro was made available for the Corona short time work model, a simplified, particularly attractive form of short time work. It secures the continued employment of skilled workers and preserves the liquidity of companies. Austrian jobs will be saved even in challenging times. We hope so. Working time and use the related remuneration can be reduced by a maximum of 90%. Employer receives a short time work grant provided by the employment market service, which covers most of the additional costs incurred by a net compensation rate of 80 to 90% depending on the previous net income. Austria was among the first countries in Europe who has a complete lockdown. Austria's approach has paid off. COVID-19 is currently under control. Now we are among the first ones to reopen the economy. The strategy is in a nutshell, as much freedom as possible, as many restrictions as needed. It's fully supported by the Federal Chamber of Commerce. As many tests as possible, restrictions such as physical distancing, necessity to wick a mask in shops, public transports, staff at restaurants. Good containment strategy. Based on this positive development, Austria started to reopen parts of the economy. What we try to do is to reopen very slowly and very carefully step-by-step -step approach, always two weeks in between. Since Tuesday after Easter, shops under 400 square meter in size are allowed to reopen along with hardware stores and garden centers. Garden centers were very important for all people because we like to work in our garden. Strict, rule on, strict rules on physical distancing. 
larger stores, including services like hairdressers and restaurants opened in mid-May. As you can see, I had not the time <laughs> to go to the hairdresser. Uh, schools opened gradually in mid-May. Hotels opened gradually since the end of May. Events and trainings, which means our profession, started since the end of May. Big problem for our profession, let me say. Leisure facilities such as cinemas, adventure parks, fitness club, touristic attractions allowed to open since May 29. At the same time, we watch numbers very, very carefully. We will slow down our reopening plan if necessary or if needed, pull the emergency brake again, which we don't hope for sure. There is definitely light at the end of the tunnel. The situation will remain difficult and we need to remain vigilant, but we will have a kind of new normal. So the new normal, and I come now to the part of the consultants, you need to know that's our world in which we live now and how is the new normal for consultants. Important and in cooperation with consultants will be for companies to take the first step towards enabling the company of tomorrow to take a fresh look at what they really are and to shape themselves in a new, more flexible and dynamic way in which capabilities are decoupled from corporate business functions and the external ecosystem is leveraged to the maximum. We consultants should provide a view on how to lead the change. Issue number one, and I fish five issues. Issue number one, strategy consulting is just a crucial. This crisis is a burden on companies, but it is a change to reinvent old processes. A crisis can be a time of sustainable change in which old structures are overhauled when new ones are reinvented. It can be difficult for a business person to escape their own constricted view on things, as we know. Time plays an important role here. Business consultants can shorten the duration of crisis considerably. Issue number two, financial and liquidity planning by consultants, essential for overcoming crisis. The Austrian government provides funding and financial aid to single member companies and small and medium sized enterprises, bringing them much needed support. The next step must be a future-oriented strategy with liquidity plans that bridge financial gaps at its core. This is where our consultants' expert knowledge comes into play. Together with companies, they outline financial and liquidity plans in order to ensure the survival of Austrian and all over the world companies. Issue number three. Nevertheless, it's becoming increasingly clear that one effect of the crisis has been acceleration of trends that were already there, such as virtualization of the workplace, further penetration of digital technologies, for example, AI and IoT, and asset light business models that make business more responsive and resilient to rapid shocks. Issue number four, our next step on the future of companies are R and D levels. If companies are increasingly shifting from making products to providing solutions, and many are, what does this mean for R and D function? The answer may surprise you. And by the way, it's not just about digital technology. Providing solutions rather than just products is important, driven by the key trends around customer expectations and digital technology, many companies are finding they can multiply business value by turning their customers into long-term subscribers. However, it's easier said than done. How should companies go about it? Consultants are in demand. Issue number five, and finally, without apology, our remaining subject is addressed two of the most written about. So some may say overhyped technologies in today's world, the IoT and blockchain. 
with the advent of 5G, the IoT is on the cusp of finally delivering the transformational change it always promised. And now is the time for companies to shape up their strategies, particularly when it comes to their own networks. To go through the hype and look of what is needed for blockchain to deliver its huge potential for the global transportation industry. So our original pre-COVID theme of the new normal of consultants is still pertinent. And in fact, in some ways, it will be even more so as business focus on recovery and regrowth over the coming months and years. As we look ahead, the capacity to adapt, innovate and reinvent, as well as have a strong balance sheet will be critical. Anyway, the expertise of uh, management consultants is more important than ever. I hope you enjoy my insight and I wish you every success in moving forward from the crisis and shaping up uh, for tomorrow and happy Consultants Day. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alfred. That was uh, an excellent overview. I, I really appreciate that. I do see some questions coming in, but we will share the questions until we've heard from, uh, from all of the uh, participants. So, uh, so uh, thank you, Alfred. Uh, very, uh, very insightful. I'd now like to introduce um, uh, Jan Willem. Uh, Jan Willem and I uh, know each other very well. He's the uh, a director of the board of ICMCI. Uh, he's um, also the treasurer of ICMCI right now and filling in that role for us. And he's a partner with uh, De Galan Group in, in the Netherlands and um, has um, agreed to address us today with his insights into uh, what the new normal uh, might look like. So uh, without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Jan. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dwight. Um, and I'd like to give you some um, um, ideas and some background on uh, the way I look at what the new normal uh, should look like, is looking like, um, I face some difficulties with the uh, pronunciation of the new normal because yeah, what is normal and what is abnormal? That is something that is very interesting to me. And the new normal, uh, well, uh, I try to find some ways to reflect on it. And therefore, I gave my little speech the title, uh, Corona Crisis, Fast Forward to the Future. Um, because the new normal is about the future. And then I will address uh, three uh, teams. Uh, first, the buffer economy. And secondly, the, um, uh, uh, what I try to emphasize a little bit, we are practicing for the climate crisis already now. And third, uh, the digital future is now. Um, but before that, I will focus a little bit on what is happening in my country, the Netherlands. Um, as Alfred uh, told you, uh, the uh, way that Austria deals with COVID-19, uh, we had a smart lockdown, as we call it, not a total lockdown. And the smart lockdown uh, meant that you could go outside, but you need the distance of one and a half meters. Uh, stay at home if you feel ill. Uh, don't go anywhere. Restaurants, bars, etc., are closed. Um, and to me personally, uh, this COVID crisis is um, a very interesting way of looking at uh, leadership in uh, crisis. Uh, because um, in my country, I'm also in the military. And in my country, we have established um, a disaster team uh, from uh, cabinet ministers. And next to that, we have 25 uh, security regions uh, headed by the mayor of the biggest uh, city in that region. And every region has a staff. The, uh, all the mayors were, uh, are working together in addressing the crisis, together with the fire department commander, the police commander, uh, the uh, public health director, and the military commander. And in my region, I am the military commander. I'm a lieutenant colonel of the reserve in uh, the region where I live. So every week now, we have a crisis team uh, addressing what is happening in COVID. And um, later on, we will evaluate it. And what I see as a consultant now already 
if I take my normal profession uh, to those meetings, I see leadership in different ways. Some are excelling in a, in a crisis, but some leaders um, aren't leading at all. Uh, so that is very, very interesting from our point of the profession. What a crisis can do with public servants or mayors who are in responsible uh, positions. So that's my personal part in, uh, in addressing uh, the problems we face with this crisis. And um, uh, in my country, we have now about 6,000 uh, corona deaths, but we are unleashing uh, everything. Um, restaurants open this week uh, with a small crowd, etc. So we're not only having a, we, we didn't only have a smart lockdown, but uh, we are also trying to establish a smart opening up the society again. Uh, that's what uh, the, the phrases are. Um, focusing on the three teams uh, I wanted to address. First of all, the uh, buffer economy. Um, and what we see in my company is that uh, the companies we do advise and organizations we do advise, um, uh, they are faced with a new challenge. Um, now, um, for instance, we have the just-in-case ideas of management instead of the just-in-time ideas of management. Um, and to give you an example, also related to the crisis, one of my colleagues um, had, uh, has had a big, very big assignment from government because uh, the uh, facial masks we are lacking in the Netherlands and normally for our um, health departments, hospitals, etc., uh, facial masks, uh, medical facial masks, they were in abundance and you ordered them and they were there. But what we saw now in the first weeks of the crisis, that there was not enough of those uh, medical masks. So we, we had a task force um, and they discovered something interesting in, a, in what I call the buffer economy. Um, you have to be aware of the, uh, the fact that in sometimes cases like this, uh, you face crisis. And if you face crisis, you need to have your uh, stuff uh, with you already. And it's not only about the, uh, the facial masks, which we now have in abundance. Um, we have a storage of about a billion face, medical face masks now ready for the second wave of COVID, if it comes. Uh, so we do not rely on ordering anymore uh, if we just need them, because they can't be shipped. Um, no planes, no nothing, no ships. So that's totally different. And this example, uh, uh, can you, you can elaborate this example to other areas in the economy. Also on the financial part, um, a buffer economy, what we see now, is that uh, cash is king and big companies with a lot of cash can cope with this crisis um, and what we see in smaller companies uh, very often especially restaurants um, who um, uh, have a, a cash flow which is a constant cash flow uh, but they don't have big reserves so what we see now is uh, a two-way street companies and organizations that still do well, uh, which have buffers, and companies that are facing a direct challenge in surviving. So for us, for us as consultants, it's quite complicated to understand that where this wasn't an issue at all in uh, just the three months ago, because if you had a, a good cash flow, you could continue with your business. But if there's not enough cash flow, to face challenges like we are facing now, you're in big shit. So um, the example of the uh, medical ma uh, masks and the example of the financial part of how you operate your organization is something we have to find solutions for as consultants. The second theme I had in mind was the, uh, what I call the practicing for the climate crisis. We were having lots of discussions on a green economy, etc., cetera. Um, but that uh, didn't, um, well, it, at least in my country, a lot of discussions, a lot of ideas, but progress is slow in uh, 
greening our, I do not know Dwight if that's correct English, in greening our economy. Um, and what we see now is with this uh, COVID crisis, uh, 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 fast forward to the future, that we learn how to deal with a crisis that is imminent. And it's right here. And what we have to learn from this crisis, how we are going to deal with the climate crisis that is there already, but sometimes we do, we do underestimate that this is a real crisis that is threatening. And uh, where Alfred said something about his first point about strategies for the future, it, to, to me and to my colleague consultants, we had some discussions already about how we can uh, bring lessons learned from this imminent crisis to the more underground crisis that is going on, which is the climate crisis. How can we take care of that? How can we find new ways and new solutions to address these complicated issues? Um, well, you can say a lot of about, uh, about that, but it, for my time now, addressing this issue and uh, uh, saying we have to practice for the upcoming climate crisis, which will become imminent in one, two, three, maybe five years to come. That is the key issue. Third issue, as I said, the digital future is now. Um, I once was uh, the vice president of uh, CIPIS, the Council of European Professional Informatic Societies, and I was uh, doing a lot of with IT. And some who were in the last uh, around uh, two hours ago couldn't understand it because I, my computer failed. And that's the first time I had a computer crash. Uh, but I repaired it. Now I'm here. Um, and we're back. The digital future is now. As I watch very closely to, for instance, to what my daughter, as an example, is uh, facing now, is the interesting idea that um, in her school, everything, she's at the, at the gymnasium, so it's a very classical school where you learn Latin and Greek, etc. And they do everything with books and paper. And in two days' time, they set up for 1,500 um, uh, pupils, all personal accounts into MS Teams. And in two days' time, it went completely digital in the last three months. So as consultants, we uh, are discussing a lot of issues in digital transformation with our clients. But then from an organizational consulting perspective, not as an it uh, but in the way an organization can work. And that is a tremendous difference since we now have learned that you can make progress in this field very fast um, to help our clients in addressing these issues. This morning, I heard the CEO of a big energy company in a Zoom meeting telling all the people that um, uh, until September 1, nobody is coming to the office. They are working about 800 people at the headquarters. Uh, and then maybe one day a week, they are allowed to come to the office and um, working from home is the new normal. Um, but there are also interesting issues like, uh, do how, why do we travel abroad so many times? Uh, or another interesting question, uh, why do we need lease cars from, um, in our fleet? Uh, so she said, we can get rid of them, all those lease cars. That will be a problem if you like cars. Um, so the digital future is now is also a new challenge for us as a consultant because it went not very rapidly where if you see a crisis as an opportunity, now we learned together that you can do some extras in it. Then um, to finalize my uh, uh, contribution, a personal point. Uh, if I look at my own company, as you said, the Galan Group, we have uh, about 50 employees and about 120 people working every day in, uh, out there with uh, real um, uh, organizations, real companies. The last five months, we saw an increase of our turnover of more than 11%, which made it the best year ever until now in our 40-year existence as a company. So we didn't expect this. Uh, but we see that there's a lot of opportunities for us as consultants. In, if you look at the three teams I described, where you can work your butt off, um, as I did. 
uh, I was never ever so efficient in giving consultancy to my clients, uh, sometimes uh, in real life, but very often with MS Teams and sometimes Zoom. Uh, and uh, we could bill our clients in an immense way. We were shocked. And of course, uh, some final, the, the way we did this was that we had strong relationships lasting for many years with our clients who rely on us as their independent consultant to help them out in crises like these as we are facing now. And then I do understand that if this crisis holds on uh, for many more months or maybe years, and if we have a second wave and a third wave, a lot of damage can be done. Um, and, it, and then um, I'm trying to be an optimist, but I do understand that you can see it from a more pessimistic way and that this crisis can be a giant setback to world economy. If I face what is happening in America now with the 30, 35% unemployed, that's amazing. My country is far worse off um, and uh, we have a, a different kind of working potential in our country and our unemployment rate went up only 2% until now. And I hope we can keep it that way and that my optimistic ideas about the future can come true. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jan Willem, that's, uh, that's excellent. Uh, your closing remarks uh, brought to mind a quote I heard from Winston Churchill, uh, which is never waste a good crisis. So <laughs> a good point. So thank you. And, and thank you everyone for the questions you're putting into the comments box. I am monitoring those and, uh, and we will follow, uh, follow up with you at the end of our third presenter, who I'd like to now introduce, who is uh, Chris Harper. Uh, he's uh, a senior uh, director with his firm in Canada in digital transformation. Uh, he is a CMC. He's also certified in, uh, as a business analyst uh, professional. Uh, he's also a professor at the University of Calgary, so he uh, wears many, uh, many different hats. And uh, in the ICMCI world, he is the delegate from CMC Canada. So I would like to uh, now turn it over to you, Chris, and uh, we're looking forward to your remarks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dwight. Thanks, Alfred. Thanks, Jan. Uh, so yeah, as, as has already been discussed, I think the, um, the, the nature of things as they are right now is that things are highly unpredictable. There's a lot of volatility. Um, and so I'm gonna share some comments that are gonna be a little bit more macro and then I'm gonna move into the more day-to-day -day experiences that we have working with our clients. And so when I look at the level of unpredictability that we have, so much time in typical strategy planning is spent on trying to predict the future and establishing those assumptions and then building goals and target destinations that organizations will seek to move towards. What we found in this situation with COVID is that that was very cute of us to, to do those things. Mm -hmm. um, those, those things are, are built on assumptions that have very quickly proven false. And so not only do we have economic crises and organizational crises, and as I've seen in the chat box um, while the others were speaking, um, around the leadership question, we in some cases have leaders in organizations, in governments, and in society that don't know what to do. And for the leaders, that's a very scary thing. And for the people that are depending on them for some certainty and stability, both emotionally, financially, and otherwise, um, that is quite disturbing. And so the, the nature uh, of the situation now and the nature that's always been here, we probably just compartmentalized it and slightly minimized its impact is that we are not very good at predicting the future. Um, and so uh, what I'll talk about is, is in the next section here is a little bit about how we respond to that. And so we don't respond to unpredictability by trying to pretend that we have certainty, right? How we respond to that is we focus on what we can control. And to Ali, this is a little bit to your question in the box around how this changes, how we need to view strategy. Strategy cannot be viewed anymore, in my opinion, uh, as being a, a certain thing, like a plan that is five to 10 years out that we're gonna measure against, that is, that is unrealistic in the face of so much volatility and uncertainty. And so what we need to change around how we think about strategy is we need to focus on strategy as a system of adaptation in the organization as opposed to a system of stability and certainty. Because anytime we have a strategy, 
that we feel provides us with certainty and we restructure our organizations to align with it. What we are doing is creating structures that are perhaps too resilient in the face of uncertainty and are difficult to change when that uncertainty changes the variables and the assumptions that the strategy is based upon. And so the new normal is uncertainty. Um, it always has been, it's just we've been forced to acknowledge it. Uh, our response to the new normal needs to be around creating organizations and guiding clients in a manner where they can adapt and they have the ability to adapt. And that also means that the management of the organization through control mechanisms is reduced. So when we structure organizations like large physical assets um, and we have elevators and we have staircases and we have bathrooms and we have rooms and offices and things like that to restructure an organization, which is classic strategy, uh, where you define the strategy and then you architect the organization to support it as though it was an asset. When we structure organizations like that, uh, that is not necessarily good because we can't adapt. We can't move the staircase. We can't move the elevator shaft without really causing a lot of trauma to the organization of that building or that fixed asset. And so we need to start thinking around strategy about being more about the ability to adapt and the capability to adapt, as Alfred had mentioned earlier. We need to focus on strategy as a way to create adaptation so that the organization can respond to changes that it can't control, but better control its response by creating those adaptive functions. And so that's a really, really key thing. Um, clients want certainty, they want stability. As consultants, we can't provide that. That is just not the context that we live in, but we can help them create structures that are not just resilient, but adaptive in the face of that uncertainty. And so if you're not familiar with concepts like SAFE, um, if you're not familiar with concepts like agile methodology, which typically come out of the IT world, um, it might be good to start getting familiar with some of those concepts because they're coming out of IT and there's starting to be a broader recognition in the organization that these adaptive functions that were incubated in the information technology zone are going to start having applicability and strategy. And the more I've been researching this over the past year, the more I've started to see some peer-reviewed research coming out around this um, from the universities and also starting to think, see this uh, occur where IT is acknowledging that these concepts are starting to move outside of IT into the larger organization. So what does this mean for consultants? Um, okay, so this is gonna seem really primary and almost childish, <laughs> but I'm from Canada, so get used to it. <laughs> uh, whiteboard markers, if you are used to conducting your strategic workshops and your client engagements using whiteboard markers, you're gonna to need to find a different way to deliver your product uh, because none of us might be in a whiteboard room with clients with you know, 15 executive members anytime soon. Um, if you're not familiar with tools like Miro and tools like Stormboard, again, um, it's good to start researching those things. I know in my organization right now, we're a mid-sized consulting firm in North America based out of Canada. Um, we're using Miro right now as part of strategic planning for one of our clients. We're doing a strategic planning process completely digital um, with no human to human interaction. And so using tools like Miro and Stormboard is really key to enabling those types of functions. The other thing you need to do is you need to almost be like a psychiatrist for some of your clients. You need to help them reduce the noise that is coming at them. If you go on LinkedIn nowadays, if you are brave enough to go on Twitter nowadays, <laughs> there is so much information out there around this situation and what it means and what leaders need to be doing. But there is so much information that how do you tell what's actually relevant to what's actually not relevant. And so we can be that regulating barrier between the client and information so that they can receive salient information and we can help guide them with relevant action through that. Um, also, those big, big projects that we maybe relied on in past years, those are probably gonna become fewer and fewer. And so focusing on those microservices that are a little bit more smaller, but have value for the client um, and is a little bit more of a, a cash flow uh, appetite. They have a bit more of an appetite for that smaller cash outflow, but they're still getting good value. Um, that would be really important to convert some of your services to something along those lines. And then finally, um, making sure that your relationships, if you've relied on person to person relationships and you know going for beers, or going for wine with folks after work, um, 
you know, those days, are, they seem to be coming back, but we need to diversify how we maintain relationships digitally. I know for me, I have like two Zoom meetings on Fridays where I have beer with my gents, and then I have one with, my, with some of my great lady friends there afterwards where we have wine. And so, you know, maintaining those relationships is really, <laughs> well, yeah, I think it, Jan's got a beer there, it looks like. <laughs> it's, I think you're eight hours ahead of me or something, eh? <laughs> and in Canada. I can so, drink wine already. <laughs> so we need to take those relationships digital that's that's really key and and i think that that's very possible it's uncomfortable at first but i know for myself and my organization i work out of our headquarters like a uh, distance away from it um, i've never felt more connected to my company than i have actually in this situation because we've all connected digitally and applied intention to that and so really important. So like I said, if you're relying on mark whiteboard markers to do your services on the strategy side and workshops, you need to move that digital. Um, you need to reduce the noise for the clients. Um, you need to make your services a little bit smaller and more precise. And then maintaining those relationships is key. And then the key thing around strategy is that we, we really need to work with clients so that strategy is not a fixed asset that we build and can't really change. Uh, we need to help them create organizations that are adaptable and able to respond. And there's a lot of good work that's coming out of the information technology area into areas outside of IT, which will really help enable that type of transformation in organizations. Because if we transform and we do micro transformations and small adaptations, those large transformations and large disruptions become unnecessary because we've created an organization that adapts like a biological organism itself, right? Evolution is not an event. Evolution is a process. And organizations are very similar to that. And the current uncertainty is demanding we change our perceptions around stability and how we predict it. So those would be my comments. Dwight, I'll hand it over to you for questions. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, that's uh, very insightful. Uh, yeah, I've had to retire my whiteboard markers, unfortunately, so I hear what you're saying. <laughs> we, we have a lot of questions here, and, and I know um, speakers have been monitoring the, um, the chat box as well, so if there's anything in particular that you want to comment on or you have some insights, just, uh, just feel free to, uh, to jump in. Uh, one, one of the more fundamental questions, and it's one that none of us have addressed, is from um, uh, uh, Tarek Rashid. Uh, he's asking about SDGs, the um, Strategic Development Goals of the UN. How would these be affected positively to consulting business and which are the most effective negatively or, or might need to change? Are, are any of, uh, of our panelists here uh, involved in, uh, in the uh, SDGs? So uh, what I, 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 I can remark to that briefly and, and um, SDGs are not my area of expertise. I, I do know, I have read the 20 odd of them that are in place. And they all really are to deal with the improvement of, of economies and, uh, and uh, the, the improvement of life generally. So, uh, so they're all moving in a positive direction. So, so the only comment I'd have on that is that the work we've done around the National Consulting Index is looking at what is the relationship between management consulting and the economies and the success uh, of countries in terms of GDP. And, and we see a very strong correlation there. Uh, so, so there are overlaps, but they're, they're not directly related. So, um, well, I guess they're, yeah, they're indirectly related. So they move in the same direction, but in, in different ways. Uh, so anyway, we, we just launched the NCI today. So I think that would be something very interesting to, uh, to follow up on you, uh, Dr. Rashid. If you allow me just to please. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, thank you, first of all, for this informative and uh, session. Uh, actually, I work with the United Nations and the International Training Center of the UN. Uh, and the UN, since 2015, is working on the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. uh, we have 17 SDG. First, uh, poverty, and then we go towards uh, well-being and hunger and quality education, then uh, innovation, infrastructure, new cities, smart cities. So some of these are actually affecting negatively, spe specifically for the poverty rate now is going uh, increasingly uh, due to some people lost their jobs. And actually the UN now trying to uh, modify how can we actually get back to this SDG positively. Even hunger is affected uh, negatively. Well-being is affected negatively. Uh, education is actually on the middle. 
because face-to-face uh, -face training has its own uh, plus also rather than uh, uh, online training. However, in, in consultation, my concern was uh, where to just, how can we help from the SDGs concept towards a new consultation area that we can benefit from? And thank you. Thank you very much. That's uh, that's excellent. I appreciate that feedback and that elaboration. Jan Willem, yeah, you'd like to talk okay. yeah. Since um, I said um, that my second theme was that uh, uh, we should um, move forward to, to um, uh, the uh, that we are practicing for the climate crisis, um, and then um, this remark um, uh, reminds me of the fact that if I do a next strategy session. Um, I can make use of the SDGs from UN uh, to help it, uh, to help me uh, discussing it with an executive board, not only from the perspective of the company itself, but also from a more um, mondial perspective. Um, and therefore, uh, those uh, 20 UN uh, SDGs can be helpful to um, help bring a new perspective on the table concerning strategy that is not only internally driven or the direct consequences around our organizations, but also from a, a world perspective. That, that's interesting. I have to think it over, but uh, it helps me a lot. So uh, that's not only giving, but it's also thinking. <laughs> that's what this is all about. It's all about uh, sharing uh, ideas and information and best practices with each other. Um, Chris, you did address this, but I want to see if you might want to have something further to say or the other panelists. It's from uh, Ali. How should we revise our understanding about strategy? What are the emerging trends in the area of strategy? And, and Chris, you addressed that directly. Uh, Jan Delem, um, have you anything that you'd like to, uh, to add to your thoughts or Alfred in terms of strategy um, based on what Chris has said? Alfred, uh, you're mute. You're muted. Perfect. So now you can hear me. Yes. I would uh, say something to this point uh, because uh, I think um, fear is the strongest motivator we learned now in this uh, crisis time. And um, uh, when I remember back some, uh, some trainings uh, where we created strategies, uh, I tell you frankly, sometimes we are very theoretical and not practical. So I think the combination in strategy um, should include also risk management and uh, much more, we should give much more value uh, to, the, to the classic SWOT analysis with, uh, with strengths and, and, and so on. And we have some uh, tools, uh, we should uh, be more practicable in, in this, uh, working with these tools. Also, if, if you combine ISO 9000, all companies have ISO 9000, but please ask the companies, what have you done now with your risk management, with the process risk management? How did you manage your process now from the point of uh, taking over news, uh, put it in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the process, give it to a team, what have the team done and what, what did the management do with the result of this process? most of the time nothing i tell you frankly i know many companies they said to me well risk management is very theoretical you know we have some risk yes maybe an accident on the street maybe something like this but uh, never uh, never a crisis a real crisis like this and if you have uh, the iso 9000 the new one which is already five years old and you see there is one point saying context of the organization, which means in which context is the organization to the rest of the world. Up from now, mm -hmm. we have it much more easy to explain the clients. We should speak also about crisis, for example, or for if, if the weather is not good, we have a, a big changing now uh, in, in weather situations and so on. So I think we come more down to earth with this crisis <clears throat> and, uh, sorry, and uh, uh, doing really things with our models we have already, with the tools we have already. 
We should mm -hmm. much more work with these tools and uh, much more believe in these tools. Then, then a strategy, strategy could be a new one because it's not new, but we believe in it. Yeah. And that's maybe the new thing. Wonderful. Thank you. Jan Villa, I might see you have your hand up here. Yeah, uh, I will. Uh, I would gladly follow up on Alfred. Uh, sometimes you have to be very practical. Uh, so strategies are okay, but being practical is uh, is key now. Uh, as I said in um, uh, the way I described um, uh, the first thing um, um, in uh, my presentation about the buffer economy, uh, what what I said something I said something about the just in case management instead of the just in time management. So. Nobody thought about the just-in-case management ideas. Uh, it's also about uh, what Alfred said about risks. But it's very practical, and it becomes very practical. And what you see now is what I try to stress, that financial buffers and supply buffers are essential as well, so that companies and organizations can become more resilient. That's the, that's the word that Christopher used as well. Resilience is key to me. So you have to connect nice strategies to very practical ideas about the here and now, otherwise you're out of business uh, or you're facing big problems. So resilience is, um, I don't not know the, I think it's the proper English word for it, but it's, that's key. Uh, I, thought, I, I listened to Chris very, very carefully and he used the word as well. So to me, being practical is uh, becoming more resilient. And I'll just elaborate on that, Dwight. Yeah, it's, it's important to be resilient, but you know, resiliency in English is like the ability of something to return to its original shape after being disturbed. And that's not necessarily the, a good thing either, right? Because you, know, it, you don't want to withstand change, you want to survive it. But you don't want to withstand change, you want to adapt to the change. And that's how organizations, um, you know, if I'm in shorts and a t-shirt and it starts snowing out in Canada, Resiliency would be me being like, I'm staying in shorts and a t-shirt. I'm just going <laughs> to it. But adaptation would be, I'm going to go get my winter coat or maybe go. In. And so we really have to keep that in mind as well. Um, and it's as more we what I try to say. That, that's <laughs> yeah, the yeah, yeah. proper English word for it. So no, at least you're good, part of it. <laughs> and, and, and I think it's the marriage of the two concepts that gives the real strength because the, the resilience, of the ability to bounce back is, is important and that flexibility to be able to do that. But I, I love the added nuance of the adaptability. You're not bouncing back to where you were necessarily. Very good. Um, there's, there's a fascinating uh, conversation here on, uh, on leadership. Um, and uh, there's a comment that it's finally, you know, addressing weak leadership and how important that is. Uh, talking about um, the pandemic being on side and weak leadership from government, but then also comments about it was also leadership not that strong in organizations either. And then, uh, and then uh, uh, another comment here that uh, from Constantinos thinking outside the box seems to be inadequate. We need to be thinking outside the building. So I thought that was an interesting thread. Does anyone have comments on on leadership about organizations and how we as management consultants can help our leaders to to be more strong and and uh, forthright in the things that they need to do? I think the the key thing with leadership and it ties into what Ali asked um, after Constantinos uh, about purpose and meaning is that um, leaders need to define meaning, meaning, right? They need to define the purpose for the organization that it's working towards fulfilling. Um, if your purpose is revenue and your revenue disappears, well, you have a problem because you've lost your purpose. And so your purpose needs to be something more than financial results. It needs to be something that is more enduring um, and that can guide your decisions and your actions and how you structure your organization in the face of uncertainty. That is the one thing that leaders can do is establish purpose. Um, I think uh, there's this quote, when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. And I think, I think in this situation, you've definitely got a lot of people with some great suit jackets on, but they're not wearing a bathing suit. And, <laughs> And so that's, that's the purpose of the leader, is to define that purpose for the organization so people can use that as the compass when they're trying to create certainty and like sanity in a situation like this. And so um, it's not sufficient to use financial outcomes as that. You do need to define a purpose that is more enduring 
and more within your control and to drive people towards the certainty of why we are here as an organization, whether government um, or private sector, and to um, keep oriented towards that because that's, that's your compass. And so that's my perception on, on leadership and having purpose as really the, the, the key thing that strategy needs to be oriented towards. Wonderful, thank you. We're, uh, Jan Willem, just, uh, I'll come to you in one second. We're, uh, we're down to our last two minutes, so I'd like uh, Alfred and Jan Willem to comment on that, but also for, uh, for any closing remarks that you might have in the last couple of minutes, and, and then Chris, I'll come back to you as well. And while we're doing that, though, I'd ask everyone to turn on your cameras because it's become traditional in these events that we'll get the screen capture of, of the participants for our, for our social media. So please do that. So Jan Willem, uh, your comment on that and then your, your, uh, your wind-up remarks. And then I'll okay. come to Alfred and then back to then I'll, then I'll have a short comment on leadership because I started this uh, little discussion about leadership. I think that uh, from a professional point of view as a consultant, uh, being in the military, uh, uh, I see many different things. Um, as a, in the military, you, you, you keep oversight. Uh, that's what you learn in crisis. Otherwise, you're a lousy soldier. Uh, and what I see with mayors who are not trained in addressing crisis is that some of them are, uh, are doing micromanagement in a way that is totally irrelevant. And it is... Um, it is uh, pulling people off track and that's very complicated and in a crisis like this you can't have it and also if you see the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, demonstrations all over the world also in my country we had in Amsterdam a big demonstration and our mayor is under fire now because he didn't handle the crisis very well uh, it's all out in the public and we are discussing it so that's a tremendous um, uh, effort that needs to be done with that leadership aspect and uh, a more personal point of view my people in my company uh, were a little bit in shock when the crisis started. <gasps> Is everything okay? And then uh, uh, our managing partner did a great job. He was so self-assured uh, and gave people confidence that we can face this crisis. And he showed facts and details and people were happy and went back to work and they didn't bother about all the things that don't need to, to be bothered about. And that's leadership in crisis as well. Thank you. Thank you. Alfred, closing words for us? Yes, some short words uh, about leaders. Let me say the young chancellor in Austria, he's 33 years old. Nobody believed before that he's able to manage this crisis, but he managed this crisis really extremely good. Why? Because he believed in his own words, he believed in his message, and he has a, a credibility. And this is for me one of the main things about strategy. All the rest is just a process. But now it starts in Austria that people think, why did he say that? So we start a little bit not believing in his words because we checked some small sidesteps which could be a political message, not the message to the crisis. It's a political message for the next election, for example. Mm -hmm. and, and the people check very clearly and very, very quick, which is the correct way and where do he go a little bit on the left step or right step and you check immediately. We do not believe the whole message now. So, mm -hmm. but if leaders believe in his words and, and they stay credible, then I think it's uh, the, the main thing uh, to start with a, a good uh, strategy. Wonderful, thank you. And Chris, any, any closing comments? I, I won't really say much more. It's, it's been a pleasure. Um, just wash your hands and don't touch your face. <laughs> <laughs> Rima, were you able to get the screen captures? And uh, drink some sample wines as well. <laughs> That's to celebrate the International Consultants Day. Yohona uh, is taking the, okay. uh, oh, Johanna, the screenshots. You got yeah, good. You've excellent. Got the photos. good. Well, thank you all. Uh, again, this has been excellent. We don't have slides to share with you. Uh, we had words of wisdom, which are even more important. Uh, this will come up uh, on a YouTube channel uh, tomorrow at some point, and uh, we'll send the link to you, and together we'll send you the, uh, the uh, text of the chat, because it's very informative, and you'll have uh, that as a reference uh, for the conversations that we've had. So thank you very much all. Uh, always this is good. And I guess when you bring great minds together, good things happen. And it's been demonstrated yet again. So, so thank you all. 
and whatever time your zone in time zone you are in have a great rest of your day thank you very much bye everybody bye bye, bye.